At this time, we would like to welcome our next session speaker to talk about the attributes of an effective leader. Friends and colleagues, join us in giving a warm welcome to the president and CEO of Corporate Playbook, Ms. Deb Elam. Good morning. It's like a game show introduction, right? Like, let's welcome to the stage. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, a little better than that. I flew in from New Orleans last night. How are we doing this morning? That's what I need. That's what I want. Good, great, thank you. Well, it's great to be here, and I want to thank Sid and the team for, their Sid, for inviting me. Um, always fun to speak with Hacer. One of the groups uh, when I led diversity at GE for a long time that we partnered with and always appreciative of all the good work that you guys do. Congratulations. Um, how's it gone so far? Yesterday? Today? Yeah? Thumbs up? All right. Good. Good. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, and I want to be sure, is the lavalier on? Can you all hear me when I stay awake? Good. Okay. I want to talk about the attributes of being an effective leader. Now, these are my attributes. I have 10. Um, leadership has been studied and studied and studied and studied. So you can Google it, you can see it, you can probably walk down the street and see leadership on a board somewhere. These are mine. I encourage you at some point later today when it's quiet to write down 10 that resonate for you. You may have some overlap with mine and you may not. The point is that they resonate for you and things that you aspire. Too. So we're going to get into it. I don't usually speak with notes, but I had a bunch of specific things I wanted to say today. So I am going to use notes. And I'm sure there's a clicker somewhere that she is handing me. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Shall we get into it? OK. So the first one is visionary. A visionary. A visionary leader is one who can see around corners. I'm going to say that again. A visionary leader can see around corners. And feel free to write these down. A visionary leader is one who looks toward the future, who thinks about the glass half full, who thinks about the possibilities and not the limitations. I can remember a story years ago, this is really dated, but years ago as internet and Wi-Fi was sort of coming into being. And they talked about why it was so hard for people to invent the internet because they couldn't figure out how you would connect all the wires around the world. Think about that. Because the person who did didn't think about wires. They thought about the possibilities and the future. They saw a vision. It is so important when you are leading a team to ensure that you, you, you can see something, you can point to something. By the way, these attributes are not in random order, but they're not in a particular order either. So some of them build on each other, but you'll find as we get into this that they, they all touch each other and they're all intertwined. So being a visionary, think about a visionary leader just for a second, just take 10 seconds. I want you to think about somebody that you know that you consider to be visionary and what do they do? How do they show up? Visionary leaders are passionate. Visionary leaders are those who can motivate others to move forward. The next one is confidence. A confident leader. Someone who knows where they're going. Someone who engenders trust from the team. Someone who feels like, yes, I'm willing to take a hill for that person because I feel like they, they're, they're going where I want to go. Now let's, let's talk about that for a second. I'm going to give you a very specific example because see, confident leaders, really confident leaders, know what they know, and they know what they don't know. And they're not afraid, they're not insecure to ask for help. In fact, they look at it as not so much just, I'm going to do better than somebody else. My team is going to do better. That's a confident leader. Now, I want to give you an example, because confident leaders, and for us as black and brown people primarily in the room, we know who we are, and we know who we are not. So I'm going to give you a very specific personal example. So I wore this dress today. I came down the elevator. You like my dress? It's OK? Yes? Thank you. Thank you. 
So several people told me in the, in the hall, oh, I like your dress, really nice dress, da 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 So maybe not what people typically wear to business events. I was at a client site a couple of years before the pandemic, and we were working with a group of Latin leaders. And a young Latina told a story that she was going to get an award from her company. She was so excited. She called her mother, I'm getting a leadership award because the project she worked on had saved the company all this money. And it made, it, it made things good for them. It was fantastic. She was so excited. She called her mother, her father. She called everybody. She said, I'm getting this award. I'm so excited. Her family was thrilled. So then her boss called. Her boss was a white female. Her boss said, hey, and her boss had been a big supporter of hers, a big sponsor, said, hey, you're going to get the award. Yes, I know, I know, they told me. The chairman is going to present it to you. Oh, yes, yes, I'm so excited. Well, I just wanted to prep you for this. So this person was being very interested, I see a few of you smiling, in being helpful. And the person said, well, when you go, you may want to just think about what you wear. What do you mean? Well, you may want to just, you know, kind of leave some of the Latina at home. What do you mean? Well, you know, maybe wear something black or blue. Tone it down a bit. And so what should have been the highlight of her year left her confused. So I wear this to salute my Latina sisters with confidence today. Be a confident leader and know who you are and what you are and what you bring to the table. Now, being decisive, being decisive is critical. Show of hands, unless your boss is in the room. <laughs> How many people have worked for somebody that was indecisive? It sucks, right? It sucks. I mean, the person is like back and forth. Should we do it? Should we not do it? Let's have another meeting. Let's have another conference. Send me a memo. Oh my God, can we just get it done? You know, I see you laughing. You know who that person is. Think of them in your minds. I write it like on a note, like, like a scribble the name like right next to it. You think about it later. Don't tell anybody though. But the point is, decisive leaders do what they say they will do. My grandfather used to say, your word is your bond. Your word is your bond. Do what you say you are going to do. Stand up. My daughter, who is 24 years old, has a saying. She says, say it with your chest. You know, that's what the young people say now. So be decisive, because if you are indecisive, it does what? It creates chaos. It creates inefficiency. It wastes money. It wastes time. It frustrates people. We are in a place now where, if, if nothing else, we need leaders who are willing to take a stand and move forward with the project. Even if it's not correct, even if there's an error, at least move forward. Does that make sense? Great. OK. Decisive leaders are also able to synthesize information. They're able to take what's given to them and, in a, in, in, and quickly make a decision. So take the information that you have. You'll receive data, and it's OK. Take a, take a while. You don't have to say, well, i got to decide everything right now. But in a reasonable amount of time, take your best uh, decision on the data that's been presented to you, on what your team has shared. Have confidence that your team knows what they're doing because you hired them, right? And you only hire good people, right? That's supposed to say right now, right? <laughs> Listening for the feedback, right? We only hire good people. Thank you. So be a decisive leader. Now next, laser focused. So as black and brown leaders, we are the masters of multitasking. We multitask like nobody's business. We are everything to everybody. We are mothers, husbands, fathers, sons, daughters, caregivers, neighbors, the helper. We do all of those things. But we have to keep focused on the big task at hand. Laser-focused leaders know how to block out noise. They know how to ensure the big goal is accomplished. We know how to step back and say, hmm, you know, if we, if we, if we, if we got to do this, and then maybe we won't do that, but we know how to come back to the core, the core of focus. Make sense? 
think about how you might go about being more focused on what you're trying to do. Because a lot of things will come at you. And as you get further and further into your leadership, you know, I was in the C-suite for a long time. When you're there, stuff is coming at you all the time, everywhere. But it's important to be able to say, okay, what's really the goal? What are the key elements to get to that goal? What are the key resources I need to get to that goal? And let me, let me stay there. Think about, a, envision a laser, and let me sort of stay there. So an attribute of a great leader is being laser focused. One saying in the black community and others is keep your eyes on the prize and don't sweat the small stuff, sweat the big stuff. Now another attribute, and this really should go without a lot of conversation, is integrity. It's integrity. It's at the very heart of being an effective leader. Because if people can't believe that you operate with integrity, you have nothing. And I mean operate with integrity, not just in the workplace, but in your lives, with your children. My, my daughters are in their 20s. And so I have to demonstrate for them how integrity shows up. If you demonstrate that for your teams, they will work with integrity. How you work across the organization. Can people believe in what you say? Or it's like, well, you know, she said this in the meeting, but, you know, I don't know. Don't ever be that I don't know person. Be the person that they know for sure. Because leading with integrity across the arc of your career builds your credibility. It means that when you say something, people believe it. People will, I, you know, if, if somebody tells me there's certain people who've worked for me over many years, if they told me something was going to happen, I never thought about it anymore because they always led with integrity. And if for some reason it wasn't going to happen, I knew they were going to come to me and tell me what happened and why it wasn't going to happen. I never worried about it. Now, there were other people I had to wonder about. Who are you? Are you the person? that people don't have to worry about? Or are you the person people have to wonder about? Who do you want to be? Being accountable. This one gets a lot of play. Does the buck stop with you as a leader? Or do you throw folks under the bus? Lots of people throw people under the bus. Do you step up and say, yes, this is my team. Yes, this is what we're trying to do. Yes, I am accountable. Or do you shirk it? Do you try to shift blame? Do you look for excuses? You got to take responsibility, whether you made a good decision or a bad decision. There was a uh, woman who worked for me a few years back. We were working on a big, big, big IT project. And it was a big transformational project. A lot of money, a lot of people involved, long lead time. And uh, it was going to change how we did some things to make life a lot easier. And it had a lot of external interface to it. So it wasn't like it was just my team that was going to see it. We were dealing with the guts of it. But the everybody else was going to reap the benefit, if you will, our clients, if you will. And I can remember her coming to me in a meeting, we were doing these update meetings, and she said, we're not going to make it. And I said, what do you mean we're not going to make it? Because <laughs> I'm human. I said, what do you mean we're not going to make it? She said, we're not going to make it. So I was upset. I was visibly upset. I said, why aren't we going to make it? What happened? And she proceeded to tell me. And then she told me what her role is and things that she could have done differently. And I said, you know what? It's fine. I'm upset because I needed to be true. I am upset and I am disappointed. But at this point, you said you are accountable. So let's figure out how we fix this. Because when people are accountable and when people come clean, you can work with that. It's when people start hiding stuff and shifting stuff and pointing and doing this that it becomes really hard 
to move forward. So be an accountable leader. You are likely to have folks say, you know what, I'll work for her again in another job, in another life, in another company, because she, the buck stops with her or him. Now, having a positive outlook during difficult situations. We've been in a hell of a difficult situation for the last two years, something called a pandemic. We have lost loved ones. We have learned new ways of doing things. We've learned how to use Zoom. <laughs> We've done all kinds of things. The people who made out best in all of this, in my observation, are the people who kept a positive outlook. And, and I mean, look, we, we're, you know, think about, don't think about where we are right now. You know, we're wearing masks now, we're being precautionary, most of us are vaccinated. Think about where we were in June of 2020. In June of 2020, none of us knew if we were gonna make it, or our family members, we just didn't know. We had no vaccine, we had nothing, but people who kept a positive outlook. I was having um, lunch with the president of a very large healthcare system um, last week. And I said, hey, how do you feel? You know, you, you've made it out of the other side, almost. And he said, you know, I came into my office every day. He said, because we had workers on the front lines every day who did what? They kept a positive outlook when many of us at home did not. So having a positive outlook can help move an initiative. It can help move people. It can help move resources, even in the face of undire darkness. Point out the positives along the step. If I think about the pandemic along the way, there were some milestones. Okay, there's a vaccine coming. Forget about all the noise. Lots of problems, lots of clunkiness, I know. A vaccine emerged. Solutions emerged. Masks, we didn't even have masks. We didn't even have toilet paper. We didn't, we, you know, that emerged. <laughs> Go back to 2020. It may seem like it was a lifetime ago, but think about that. Keep a positive outlook in the face of a lot of darkness. Being a communicator being an excellent communicator, being able to tell stories. How do you share? You know, all those things I talked about already, like having a vision and being confident, all that's great, but if it's only inside you, it's just inside you. How do you share that? How do you convey that to your team and to others across the organization such that they feel that they understand the vision they understand the plan. They understand the milestones. So if you can communicate to your team and to others, you can lead. Because what is being a leader? If not the ability to marshal resources, human resources, financial resources, stuff. You know, if you're in a manufacturing facility, you need stuff. If you can't garner those resources, you're not leading. You're just talking to yourself. Now, one thing I want to say about communication, because it is an underpinning of almost everything. As I said, these attributes are simply my attributes, my observation over a you know, 35 year, almost 40 year working life. It's really important to communicate and, and, and learning to communicate better is probably, of everything I've talked about, one of the easier things to address if you don't feel confident in it. There are courses, there are webinars. You can Google it till the cows come home. So don't, don't let a language barrier, don't let some tape playing in your head from when you were a kid, because maybe English wasn't your first language, don't let that stop you. Don't let that stop you. Ensure that you can communicate. And communication is not just speaking. Communication is two-way. So it is also the ability to take in feedback and take inputs 
And as I mentioned, a decisive leader takes inputs and synthesizes them. To have something to synthesize, you must hear the feedback and understand it and process it. All of that is communication. So ensure that you are a great communicator. It will help you, even if some of these other ones aren't necessarily your strength, being able to communicate well will help, help you uh, deal with a lot of the things you're trying to do as you work on some of the other things. I'm gonna have a few more slides and then I'm gonna open it up, because I really like doing questions. I like just getting into the conversation and discussion. So I have a couple of more slides. Be an excellent communicator. Now, being a team builder, being a team builder, you're nothing as a leader if you don't have followers. <laughs> you're just you. <laughs> if you're leading, is your team willing to follow you? Are they willing to follow you? I had a situation a few years ago where um, I took over a team. So I had a team working for me and, and another job, someone retired, and this other job was added to my plate. So I had diversity, I'd been the C chief diversity officer for many years, and then I was asked to run the foundation. So it was about 140, 145 million dollar philanthropic arm of the company. So I did two officer jobs for the last three years of my career. At the time I took that over, the company was going through a number of challenges. So I was asked to present a plan, four weeks after combining these jobs, Half of my team I had not met, I, I you know, was just getting to know, didn't know them for a long time. I was asked to present a plan to make 30% in budget cuts over two years. Over two years. I met with the entire team and I said, look, this is what the company has asked us to do. I need your best work. I need your best thinking. I need you to be visionary. I need you to think outside the box because for some of you, I know your job. For others, I'm just meeting you, so I don't know your jobs well. It's not like I grew up, you know, the old ways. You kind of grew up doing this job, that job, the other job. Now you're the boss. You've done all these jobs, so you know the job. I said, but I need your best work. What I commit to you is I will be open. I will communicate. I will be candid. I will tell you what I know when I know it, and if I can't tell you, I will tell you I cannot respond to that. But I need your best work on what should we do? What should we do differently? Now you guys are leaders in business. You know you can't cut your way the 30% with just stuff, some of us people. You know that. My team came back in one of the iterations. They eliminated their own jobs in a few cases. It was their best work. What I ended up doing, I was able to place a couple of them in other parts of the company. One person decided she wanted to work part-time, so it kind of worked for her anyway to do something different. But the point is, people aren't always selfish. If you lead in a, in a, in a very candid way, if you have a real team, if you, if you invoke the, the, the feeling of being a team and we are in this together, People will give you their all. So an effective leader is a good team builder. And then being empathetic, an empathetic coach. Focusing on who you are, what you're about, what matters to you. You know, this is one, interestingly, in the sort of white male dominated society of business that we have all lived in. It's one that for many, 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 many years has been squashed. It's one that's not been talked about. It's been swept under the rug. But I will tell you, in the face of coming out of a global pandemic and with the great resignation and with people saying, I will work wherever the hell I want to work, when I want to work, if you're not empathetic, if you don't lean in to understand who your workers are, and what they want and what they need and what they're about and really utilize diversity, not equality, but equity, if you don't lean in for that, you're gonna lose. 
You're gonna lose. Being an empathetic leader means understanding what makes people tick. It means, you know, I get it. So where are you on the empathy scale? Or do you think about just getting the task done? Because that's been our history in corporate America. It's like, just get the job done. Just get the task done. One, two, three, four, five, six, just get it done. You won't have anybody to get it done if you're not leaning in with some empathy. Quite frankly, I believe this is where, from a cultural competence standpoint, this is where we as black and brown people have an advantage. Because, because of our lives, the interconnectedness of our lives with our families, with our cultures, we have had to lean in. We've had to have empathy for the people around us, for our families. Many of you, how many of you are our first to go to college in your families? You know what I'm talking about. You have to be empathetic at home. You have to be empathetic to ensure everybody in your family benefits from the opportunities you've had. Use that as a strength. Don't squash that. We used to squash that. We used to leave that Latina at home. Bring that out. Bring it to the workplace. Because leading with empathy is a game changer in this post-pandemic world that we're in now. You know, being a leader, being an effective leader, um, it's hard. It's a journey into yourself. Being a leader is a journey into yourself. It's a journey into creating and recreating and innovating on yourself. It's not easy, but it's doable. See, I believe everyone has the ability to be a leader. The question is, do we focus on it? Do we work at it? Do we squash it? Do we enhance? where we have skill and capability? Is it important to us? And so if you spend time on it, I believe everybody in this room can utilize attributes and some of your own to be an effective leader. So that is the presentation part of the presentation, but I want to open it for whatever questions you may have about anything. And I think we've got folks with, uh, with the mic. As I said, these are attributes I've observed over many years. There may be other attributes that I didn't mention that resonate for you. So, anybody have a question? I'll call on people, I'm not shy. Here we go. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. So, my name is Beatrice, I'm with Anheuser-Busch. And um, I'm actually in a people director, so when you spoke about empathetic coach, that's something that I've definitely been struggling with coaching my business leaders, because um, it's definitely something I think in the last couple of years um, has become a critical attribute of a, of a leader. So is, do you believe that's something that can be taught, can be coached? Um, how do we help our leaders who perhaps struggle with that particular attribute? Thank you for the question. I actually just watched, um, was it last night? Night before last, I watched a, uh, it was on the History Channel, I believe, a documentary on the founding and the start of Anheuser-Busch. Just a fascinating, uh, fascinating story. Um, so, I believe there are some innate competencies that people have, just in general, whatever they are. So some people will be better at it than others. For some people, it will be more natural than for others. Uh, but I do believe it can be coached. I do believe not being, not, not um, empathy can't be taught, but you can be taught a process to think about how to be more empathetic if that makes sense, if there's a little difference there, a little nuance there. So I think it's very important, and there are courses out there, it is very important to think about, hmm, what can I do? So I will give, I'll give you a perfect example. I am naturally not the most empathetic leader, just as my natural attribute. It's not something that just I think about top of mind, just my makeup, I'm not. But one of the things I would do when I had a team, um, I would, on Friday, every Friday, I would walk around and thank people for their contributions. You know how people say to people in the military, thank you for your service? I would literally thank people for their contributions that week. I didn't do it every Friday, but I did it very often. So for me, that was a technique. 
It was genuine, it was authentic. I wasn't just doing it just for show, but it was a reminder to me, it was a tool, maybe that's the better word, a tool, to say, let me touch everybody here on the team so that they know they matter to me. And then on Monday, I would always say, how was the weekend? And now, you know, that seems very cursory, but sometimes people do that, and, but before you can answer, they're like getting their coffee and they're gone. How was your weekend? And they're, and they're running down here, you know? You've seen that person, see you laughing, you know who that person is. Write that person's name down too, so you remember them later. But, but the point is, um, I would try to listen, you know, the communication skills. So communication is not just being a great speaker, but it's a great listener. So yeah, the answer is yes, I absolutely think you can be taught, you can give tools and techniques. And I think part of the battle is, in this case, pairing people together to be accountability partners. That's what I would do with something like that because people are not gonna wanna be as vulnerable, you said your leadership team, around things like that because it's squishy, it's, it's what we've been taught to squash for most, many people's careers. So an accountability partner might be something that you can be, you can, you can keep it on to 100 as my daughters would say with them. Great, thank you. Yes. Hey, hi, my name's Javier Maldonado. I'm with AbbVie Pharmaceuticals. I'm really happy to hear your presentation today. Thank you for the shout out for our fellow Latinas and uh, the where and uh, your story. Your storytelling is powerful. Uh, my question is when it comes to multi-generational teams, multi-generational talent um, within the corporate sector, you know, as for example myself being uh, not only an executive for the company, but also a leader for our employee resource group, I'm starting to see this wave of new talent, younger Hispanics coming to the table that don't resonate with the same story or background and platform of experience that I've had. I'm also a first generation college student, but I'm not a first generation Hispanic. I'm Puerto Rican, second generation. But a lot of my colleagues are first generation Hispanics coming to this country. So I know it's a pretty wide question I'm asking here, but I think the, the, the core of what I'm trying to get to is when you have this matrix of multi-generational needs um, in your experience. What tactics have you taken to lead those types of groups, those types of teams, and even having those conversations with your executive teams or your leadership teams on what kinds of things to ponder, think about, and focus on for the future? Great question, thank you, and yeah, it is complex. And yeah, we've got, you know, this is the first time in history that we've got like four generations in the workforce, right? We really have, if you think about it, because people are retiring much later, some people who have retired, depending on the, the company and the job, have come back to work, right, on part-time basis. And then we've got people coming right out of college, or in some cases, right out of trade school or wherever. You know, I think it's important to, and this is sort of from a process, I'm a process person, from a process standpoint, and you mentioned ERG. It's important to sit down and almost do an exercise where you figure out what value do you bring to the workforce? age demographic. What do we learn from you? What do we gain from you? And be very intentional about that. I did a presentation about six months ago for, um, it's, a, it's an organization, I mean it's not a company, but it's an organization um, around intergenerational leadership. Because in this particular, or it's a women's organization, there are challenges, right? Where the younger people kind of want to go do, it's a service group. Younger people kind of want to go do this. Older folks, older women want to go do that. And you know, we're kind of we're bumping heads. So I said, let's sit down and figure out what do we learn from with you? What do you bring? And we did an exercise where each group said, what can we bring that the other people don't have? We have knowledge of social media. We know how to really leverage social, that's an example, social media. We know how to, we know how to do a lot of different things. And then the other group says, well, we don't know how to do this. So the question is, where can the, where's the value add for the company? Um, Another thing I would think about is what, can you pair people? So one of the things that was a concept a long time ago, but I actually think it worked, was reverse mentoring. You know, we think about mentoring as somebody senior mentoring somebody junior. But one of the things I did, I was working with a client right after the George Floyd murder, um, where we did mentoring circles where we basically had, um, interracial groups mixed to sort of mentor each other on a peer basis around some of those issues and what are those challenges and what should we do differently as a particular company. So if you can create groups that are intergenerational and have them focus on your question because they work, 
where you work. So they'll be able to say, well, yeah, you know, here in this particular company, maybe this is something we can do differently or something that will matter. And then just basically tell everybody, look, everybody here is bringing value. Everybody here is here because they want to make this company better. We want to make our family and our lives better from the income that we earn here. So we're all here for the same reason. But can we work together across generational lines? But I, I, it's a challenge. I mean, it is a challenge. I don't think anybody has it solved. Um, but if you, what, what I find is working in groups um, does help. So hope that helps. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, we have a uh, question from our virtual audience as well. So Hello, I virtual think. audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll start with this one. What would be the three top attributes that an effective executive leader most have? The three top attributes so that... Say I'll say it again. What would be the top three attributes that an effective executive leader most have? Isn't that what we were talking about for the last, I don't know, 30 minutes? Okay. <laughs> I just was it, chucking, it, like, is it me? <laughs> oh, they signed on late. Okay, all right. <laughs> they went, I was on the last one. They want me to go back. <laughs> um, look, if I had to boil it all down, um, and you know, you were to ask me, I'll, I'll frame the question this way. What do I think is most important? So I think the 10 that I gave you are all very important. What's most important? Um, I would say being an effective communicator, because if you can't communicate what you're trying to do, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter how good you are, doesn't matter what ideas you have. You know, I cannot stress enough how many people I've seen in corporate America fail who had great ideas, who were smart people, because they couldn't communicate. They couldn't communicate to their boss. They couldn't communicate to peer groups. They just didn't communicate well. They couldn't write well. I didn't mention writing when I went over that earlier, but being able to write, you know, I mean, we, you know, we work in global teams now, you know, so we rely on email. Uh, a lot of uh, workplaces now just rely on text in a way that text was never intended. <laughs> You know, text was intended like for you and your family and your people. Text wasn't intended to be texting your boss, but in the pandemic hit, that's what's happening. So just ensure that you use all of the tools available to you. So I would say communication. And then um, I do think leading with empathy is a game changer right now. I do think if you are not leading with empathy, um, because people have too many choices right now. You know, people have too many choices. If you know, if, if you don't like it, you can, you can vote with your feet. You can really vote with your feet right now. So, okay, great. Okay. Hi, go LSU. <laughs> Good to meet you. Thank you. Very interesting um, presentation. Thank you. And my question is, what advice would you share with us to educate decision makers and, and leaders to advocate, to support, and to be an, an ally for Latinas, African American, for minorities? Yeah. So um, the question is, what advice would I have to educate leaders? So this is what I do in my consulting business, and so it's a, a myriad of things. The first thing that I always tell companies, ERGs, groups that I work with is, how do you tie what you bring to the table to the bottom line? If you can tie who you are, what you do, what you bring to the bottom line, you will succeed. There are groups in the world um, that do community service, there are church groups, there's lots of all of that out there. If you are in a for-profit organization, notice, underscore the for-profit part, if you can link something unique that you have, something around a new market, a new experience, to the company's bottom line, the company's ability to grow, the company's ability to expand in other markets, you will win. And so that's what I would encourage the group, so if you, for example, if you have a Latin or an African American ERG or group in your company, I would encourage you, encourage you to meet and talk about that. Um, when I worked uh, at GE, you know, it was, it became the bread and butter. We took our black employee leadership group, so black corporate officers and our two black board members um, to the continent of Africa for a week. We took a company plane, went to the continent of Africa for one week. We met with seven, I'm sorry, we met with four uh, different presidents, Rwanda, um, Ghana, uh, in Nigeria, we, met, we went to Lagos and Abuja, um, and we talked about the product line, and we talked about how the company could help them grow, blah, 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 blah. What mattered to them was that we were black. 
it mattered to those countries and those leaders that we were black. And we explained that to the leadership of the company who was not black. <laughs> You know that. We explained that to them. We said, guess what? <laughs> you know that. We explained that to them where we said, look, because we have an affinity, a connection here, a unique connection that nobody else in this company has, we can help the company grow. And guess what? We got all kind of money and resources and all kinds of stuff because we demonstrated relevance to the purpose of the company. Does that make sense? I know it's a little nuanced. So one thing I would say is that, and then from an education standpoint, I would, you know, there's a tons of things that are out there. People can read, people can have learning circles, but having leaders understand the opportunity cost that would be lost if you don't understand your diverse leaders is huge. What are we missing as a company? What is it that we can't get if we don't have people around the table? Look at some of the things, I mean, this is like so timely, right? I don't know how much you guys have been following it, but, and I don't wanna step on any toes in here, so I won't mention the company, but let's just say for Juneteenth, which is coming up Monday, some companies have made the worst missteps ever. Some of the things that are out there, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, who was in the room when you green-lighted this? And now they're having to backpedal. <laughs> now they're having all the PR firms to go out there and make it better, and oh, it was a mistake, and oh, we didn't mean this, we gotta pull this from the shelves. Well, if you, hadn't, if you had people around the table with the right cultural competence, the right perspective, the right insight in the beginning, you wouldn't have made those errors, and maybe you would have even done something that helped to grow and helped to advantage the company. So that's the way, I, I, I talk to people about green. <laughs> I explain green, they understand the green. <laughs> green is money, if y'all didn't <laughs> get that. What else, I think, so. yes. Okay, again, thank you so much for the presentation. It was fantastic. Thank uh, you. And as well, a showcase of how you need to present an awesome content and make it engagement. Um, I want to you. add. Right. No, I just said thank you. You're welcome. My mother taught me to be gracious, so I said thank you. So. I love that. <laughs> so I just wanted to add two things from my experience of what are attributes that I find very valuable in a leader. And first one is create networks. We don't get things done alone, and knowing the right people and investing into creating that network helps anyone that is following you and your teams to really be able to empower them to make the right decisions. And with that one, it comes into the second one, that is learn how to ask the right questions. Mm. So as a leader, your peers or the people reporting to you are not in the same meetings that you are. So your job is to, write, to ask the right questions to make sure that they are connected with the right people, find the blind spots, so they can actually have a bulletproof plan going forward. Um, and that is important because you can have a bigger view than what they have, but they have m better knowledge than you into yes. the details. Yeah. So you need to write to ask the right questions so they know how to do the plan and make it forward and actually accomplish it. So just wanted to ask that, see if maybe you disagree or agree with those. And I think you should do this presentation next year. I thought that, <laughs> give them a hand, I thought those were great. No, I, I, so I agree. Um, I think asking the right questions does a lot of things because it also can demonstrate empathy. So I will give you an example. I was, when I was running the foundation, I was touring a water plant because we had done a big grant to this water plant. And, you know, we had, these were line workers, right? So who ran the, the equipment, they ran the generators to pump this water, all this stuff. I didn't know anything whatsoever about any of that. I'm not an engineer. I mean, I was liberal arts. I didn't know anything. But, I put on my boots, put on my safety goggles, put on my hat, hard hat, and I asked questions. And I said, so how does this work? And so what happens if this happens? So there was just a level of inquiry. There was a level of continuous learning. And the people lit up. They lit up. They were like, oh my God, this is great. And, and I mean, they wanted to show us, I, like, I only have an hour. They wanted to show me the whole plant at this point. So, so asking the right questions also will let your team know that you are genuinely interested. 
You know, have you ever done a presentation for somebody? You prepared something for your boss or somebody else, and they were really disinterested, and you could tell? How did you feel? You felt like crap. You know, you felt like, why did I waste my time? I put effort into this. So, so what you said, I agree with. I think the network piece is huge. That's why you're here. That's one of the reasons you're here. If you aren't connect, listen, you can connect with people so much easier now than ever before. You know, we used to have to exchange business cards and do all this. You know, you can connect on LinkedIn. We have a, the whole app here has a community in it. I hope you're using. A couple of people reached out to me before I got here, which I thought was great. You know, connect with each other. And any of you who want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you have an open invitation to do so. And I mean that because. We have to create community to help each other on this journey, on this leadership journey. So thank you for the, I don't know if it was a question or a comment, but thank you for whatever it was that you shared. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have anybody else? I think we have a few minutes left where you might get a little stretch break. Hi, Deb. Yes, hi. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, Israel Kontrovsky from uh, PepsiCo. I think a key element that was embedded in your attributes was speed of trust. Mm. And as a leader, it's a lot easier when we all used to work from the office 100%. But in a virtual world now, in a hybrid world, how do you become an effective leader in the future and build speed of trust, which is gonna be more difficult, because you're not gonna be in the office to build relationships and for people to trust you? Yeah, that's a great question. How do you build trust in a virtual world or a hybrid world, which we're in now? You know what? There are many techniques to doing that, so I will give you what I use. When I'm, you know, we've been on Zoom, 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 right? Remember the old song? Anybody old enough to remember Zoom, the TV show? Y'all are all too young for that. Few people. Anybody? Zoom, 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 I Zoom. Thank you. Old people in the room, stand up. Absolutely. Um, go look it up if you don't know what we're talking about. But there was a TV show called Zoom. Um, anyway, for me, when I'm on a Zoom call, often I will do a private chat to somebody. I do that frequently. How are things going for you? Great presentation or something. Something to make an additional connection point. Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's a connection. Building trust is a building connection. So just use the tools. The same thing that you would do or you will do when we take a break and we go out into the, the foyer and you'll connect with people and you'll create some sort of a quick relationship, which then could be a longer relationship, which could lead to trust. But use, use what you have available to you. I think you've got to make time for people. Sometimes with people I work with now, um, I'll say, hey, look, let's just jump on a call you know, Friday for 30 minutes. Not long, for 30 minutes. And, it, and I won't take 30. I'll always take 20. But I'll schedule it for 30 minutes just to do the how is it going? What are we working on? What's, just to, just to create, continue the connection points. That's what we missed. Um, and I don't, I don't happen to believe in the, you can't build trust if you're not in person. Because how did we run global teams before the pandemic? I led a global team. I had people working for me all over the world, many of whom I only actually physically saw maybe three times a year. But I built trust with them because I always, if I emailed, I would add some other little connection point. So, but what it does take, and this is where people fall short, so I'm gonna pause, because y'all all are like, what is it? People don't work with intention. It takes intention and it takes consistency to do that because we go, we start rushing, we're fast. So if you do it, you'll say, yeah, that makes sense, Deb, but you have to do it with intention. You have to repeat it. You have to keep doing it. So thank you. Question. Hi, Deb. Love your point on intentionality and connection. Diana Navas said with Microsoft. So when you started your presentation, you share about the number of books out there connected to leadership and effective leaders, right? There's a lot of research. But we know that that research is mostly based on what we think or perceive to be an effective leader, mostly a white cisgender male. And so we'd love to hear a perspective on what cultural attributes do we as brown and black people bring to this conversation of effective leadership, and how can we create a difference? Oh, great question, and I um, thank you for that. I tried to weave some of that into what I was talking about. So for example, empathy. I think we are empathetic people by nature, by who we are, by how we grew up, our, cultural, our cultures. So I think that's one you gotta bring to the table every day. Um, I don't necessarily, let me put it this way. I think the attributes I shared are universal. I think how we show up using them is how we tailor to who we are. And that's not just as black and brown people, that's almost as individuals. 
You know, how do I, so communication, right? We talked about that, that's at the top of my list. How I might communicate with you may be a little different than my white male counterpart, but I'm gonna do it in a way that's comfortable, I'm gonna do it in a way that is effective. Um, if, if, a, if a white male were giving this presentation right now, the same presentation, same slides, they would do it differently. They wouldn't have this dress on, that's for sure. <laughs> I hope. But, <laughs> but, they, but they would do it differently. So the point is, I think the attributes are universal. What I think we have to do as black and brown people, more so than ever before, we have to step into who we are. We have to step forward with who we are, what we're about, and feel and know that our lived experience is valuable. You know, we have often squashed that. Our lived experience, and I'm, and, and I'm guilty of that as well, m earlier in my career. You know, we're sitting around, we're at lunch, we're talking about something, and what people are saying is kind of like, mm, that's not really kind of how I think about it. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example, and this is maybe a little controversial now, but um, I can remember being in a conversation with some colleagues about the police, just the police in general, and how they felt about the police in general. This was a long time ago, that's what's sad. Oh, the police really are here to help you, and da 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 da, and you know, they're here to be helpful and all of that. And I remember having this moment, right? So it's that moment of, do I say something? or not. <laughs> and I think it was one of the first times I actually mustered up the courage to say something. And I said, well, you know, not everyone feels that way. <laughs> well, what do you mean? And I said, yes, there are many, many policemen and women out there who put their lives on the line every day, and that's absolutely true, and I agree with that. But for some of us, our lived experience is different. And what you have to understand is not everybody sees the world through that lens. So from my standpoint, it was communicating my truth in an effective way, which ended up, people, we got into a conversation about it because the people I was with didn't realize, like, oh, I never thought about that. Well, you didn't have to think about that. Did I get an amen here in the Latina group? An amen, I love it. An amen with the Latinx folks. I'm, I'm, that's, I'm here for that. So, so, but my point is, those attributes, I think, are universal, but how we have them show up, how they manifest in us, I think is what's different. Great, thank you. Anyone else? We have a few minutes left. Y'all are quiet, no other questions? Oh, somebody's standing up, a brave soul in the back. Hi, Deb. Hi. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your talk that leadership is about a journey, mm -hmm. very much a self journey, and those 10 attributes are a great guide. But do you have any resources to help people be brutally honest with themselves about where they really are in each of those attributes and what areas they can develop? Right? How can you help someone be introspective when it comes to leadership? So one of the things I do, so um, I guess my bio is somewhere in the app. I do a lot of executive coaching. And so when I coach leaders, um, not necessarily just those attributes, but we will talk about where are you today? What do you think you're good at? What do you think are your strengths? And what do you think are, th where, what are things that you need to work on? I will also talk to the manager. I'll talk, ask to talk to a couple of peers. People don't always necessarily want me to do that because a lot of people who I coach who are black and brown don't want anybody to know that they have a coach. And that's a whole nother thing that's out there. And I get it, right? I get it. But, uh, but we work with where we can work. But I think in those cases, um, you know, we, we, we try to get very candid. Now, I, I, you know, some people like having me as a coach, some people don't. <laughs> I keep it very real with people. And I'll say, well, you know, this is what you said two sessions ago. Why didn't you do this? Because I hold people accountable. So I think it's really important to, um, use tools, there's lots of tools out there. I don't have any particular one that I use or that I sort of advocate for, but most companies have some tools, but a lot of times we don't use them or we don't want to use them. So I would say any tool that you get will be helpful. It, look, th this is the kind of thing where I say it's a journey. It's, it's sort of like water, right? You can never drink too much water. You can never get too much. Well, I've already been to leadership training. Okay, fine. And guess what, the world changed. The circumstance change. We don't lead in a vacuum. Leadership is not, it's not like a college degree. Well, I got it, check. Leadership is a journey. 
and it's a journey about, I'm a good leader today, but the world changed. Am I a good leader now? Am I gonna be a good leader tomorrow? So whatever works for you, and I'll be very honest with you, in my you know, life now, I don't read as much. I do a lot of books on tape while I walk, because that works for me. That doesn't work for everybody. Some people want to an antenate and all of that. I get that, annotate rather, and all of that, I get that. But the point is, look out there and grab the resources that are available to you. Um, and, and, and work on where you think you need to go. So I don't have any one answer, but I think it's just the point of being intentional about being a good leader. See, a lot of people uh, will say, well, I'm a good engineer, I'm a good accountant. Those are functional skills. Functional skills are different. You can be a very good functional leader and a, ter a functional person, functional practitioner, but not a good leader. So put as much effort into that series six and all of those things as you do on being a leader of people, a leader of teams. Great. Other questions? Anybody else? Uh, I have one. Sure, Sid. Uh, hopefully you don't have questions. Uh, first of all, Doug, thank, thank you so much. It's been a great presentation. But one question is that a lot of us in this room um, you know, often have to think about um, how do we uh, uh, be effective leaders when we're the only Latino, this in the room, and and how do you think about your philosophy of being in those kinds of settings where you know that you're at this seat at the table, and you've got to show yeah. that executive, effective executive leadership. That's a great question, Sid. So for those of you who didn't hear the beginning of it, it was how do you navigate? I'll use that word. If you're the only black or brown person or woman in the room. You know, and, and Sid was in Davos, and I just cheered to see you in Davos on the social media stuff uh, representing. And in three CEO meetings, he's the only black, brown, Latino person in the room. How do you do that? Yes, yeah, so yes, let's give him a hand for that. That is quite an accomplishment. So one of the things I believe, um, and I believe that is, it is true, and I think you will agree with me, that if you are in that room, and you are the only black or brown person or the only woman, and you have that lived leadership, I think the hook is coming, and you have that lived <laughs> leadership experience, guess what? Nobody knows that better than you. There's nobody in that room who can tell you what it means to be, nobody who can tell me more about being a black woman than me. No one in this room can do that. No one can tell you, Sid, more about being a dark-skinned, Latino male than you. So in those settings, you have to have the self-confidence to know that your lived experience is valid. And your lived experience adds value to the discussion. That's the part that's different. So all of the technical knowledge you have, all of the you know, leadership experience, all of those things are great. Through your lens, as a diverse Latino or Latina or African American, you are bringing a different element to the conversation. And I guess you just have to believe that. And once you internalize that and believe it, nothing will stop you because you will know that what you're saying matters. And if they don't get it, it's their problem. It's not yours. So another thing that you might do, I got three minutes left, I still got three minutes. I'm looking at the thing, it says 346. You following instructions, okay, it says 343, let me talk fast. Um, the, other, the other part of that is, one thing, who knows what the phrase, the meeting before the meeting means? Only a couple of people, so let me tell you what that is. This is something white men have mastered for generations, the meeting before the meeting. Never, listen, this is very important, never go into a meeting to present something without knowing who's in the room, what they're about, and what their view is on what you're gonna present. Never, ever, ever do that. Now, how do you find out that information? Because you have the meeting before the meeting. You're gonna present a new initiative, and there's gonna be 10 people in the room. You go meet with at least four or five of them before the meeting, 
and you say, hey, this is what I'm going to present on Friday, what do you think? Eh, you know, it's all right. I don't know if it'll work or not. Well, what, so this, these are the questions, right, levels of questions. What, what, what about it do you not like? Well, I like this part, but, you know, I just don't know if we have the budget for it. So if I fix the budget, if I adjust it, will you be on board? Yes. Now you got a yes. Have the meeting before the meeting if you need to present and you're the only one. Then you know you're going to have the agreement. Boy, they just fast forwarded me to zero. So I guess I am out of here, ladies and gentlemen. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'll be around for a bit. Take care. <laughs>